wonderful day here and it is a couple minutes after one o'clock so I am ready to get started for today. I am really excited about uh, what I am going to teach today because one of my um, one of my things with teaching reading to my boys and girls in class is I integrate, which means I put in a lot of writing whenever I teach reading. Because when I was going to college to become a teacher, and then when I was getting my reading license on top of being a teacher, they, um, I learned that if a boy or girl is a good reader, he or she might be a good writer. But if a boy or girl is a very good writer, 99% of the time, he or she's going to be a good reader too. So I make sure to use a lot of writing whenever I teach reading because I feel like if, uh, if you can understand how to use our written language fluently, you also are going to be able to understand how to use our um, oral and our oral language correctly and be able to comprehend it in here so that it becomes part of your prior knowledge. So um, I'm going to teach you a strategy today that our school uses a lot. And I know a lot of schools are using this. This um, has started to kind of be a type of writing where teachers are teaching this to allow boys and girls to answer questions really well and easily and make sure they get everything in it. So every teacher kind of has his or her own style in teaching this, but um, I'm going to teach you, of course, <laughs> the style that I use because I'm the one that's teaching you. <laughs> so um, today, and if you are a boy or girl watching this, you're probably going to go, ah, whenever you hear it, it is race. And then in parentheses, I put inferencing and drawing conclusions because Many race questions are not what I call right there questions. You have to be able to make inferences in order to draw conclusions. And I tell my boys and girls that there are certain things in reading that are married. And I say inferencing and drawing conclusions are married. Where one is, the other one is, they're a couple. Their boyfriend, girlfriend, however you want to think of it, and they're with each other constantly. So to make an inference means that you read between the line. You read things that aren't there. It's not a right there. You can touch it on the paper answer. Um, so you have to be able to gather information that you need and then go beyond the text. So... You have to inference in order to draw a conclusion. And whenever you draw a conclusion, you come up, you're able to kind of sum it up and say, well, this is what I think that the, well, maybe that the author is telling us. So you might be able to draw a conclusion. Obviously, you draw a conclusion when you come up with a theme. You draw a conclusion when you come up with a main idea. But you also kind of make a decision based on the writing. So that's where inferencing and drawing conclusions come into play. And I already, as you could see, have a question that I'm going to answer on the board with you here in just a minute. So before we get started, let's say you have no idea what the race strategy is. You've never heard of it, heard it in your entire life and um, you need to know what it is. Or maybe, hey, I have heard of the race strategy before, but I'm not positive, I really quite get it or remember it. So race stands for this. And some people have something called races. I just kind of focus on race. Let me move it. Okay. So we have restate. That means to restate. Where's my finger? There it is. That means to restate the question. So I say these first two things lots of times can be done in the very first sentence. So to restate an answer 
can be done in one sentence only, and it's done in the same sentence, depending on what the question is. This is where it gets into the meat of your answer. This tells me, okay, it, this, is what, this is what my opinion is, but this tells me why it's my opinion. This proves that I know what the heck I'm talking about. So you have to cite evidence from the text in order to explain your thinking. So let me say that again. You have to cite evidence in order to explain. And some teachers might do this separately. I put it together because I say, if you cite evidence, it can be done in something very, very, very easy in a couple easy different phrases you can use to prove that I'm not just pulling this out of my brain. I'm not making this up. And then we can explain it. And then I'm also going to show you a good way that we can end a race question too. So, woohoo! Ready to get started. I know that you are thrilled. Mm -hmm. Nod your head, you're thrilled. All right, so last week or the week before, I read um, a story. Oh, it was about Seabiscuit, the thoroughbred horse. I read about Seabiscuit in Tales of Famous Animals by Peter and Connie Roop, illustrated by Zachary Pullen. So I read one of the short nonfiction texts in here. Oh, and by the way, race can be done fiction or nonfiction. We're going to do it with um, nonfiction today. So if you can go ahead and grab paper and pencil so that if you want to go ahead and write this down so that you can make sure that you um, remember it and use it as an example for some distance learning that you're doing here for your teacher or teachers at school, please do so. Okay. So that was a little time out. Now I'm going back to the text. Anyway, um, I read the text recently to you about Seabiscuit, the thoroughbred horse that lived in the um, 1930s and 40s here. And I said that he became very, very famous because he really wasn't supposed to be a good racehorse. And he ended up being the horse of the year, which is the biggest honor a racehorse can get in the entire year. It's a huge honor in the world of horse racing. So this time, I am going to read you a text. You know I love animals. I've read tons of texts about animals already. Um, this one is about Balto. And it takes place in Anchorage, Alaska. So here is an illustration of the beautiful dog Balto. Maybe you have heard about Balto. There have been many texts written about Balto before. Um, and this will show how a very famous race called the Iditarod race, which happens, I believe it's in um, March every year, maybe the beginning of March every year, but maybe we'll redefine that out. So it says Nome Calling, Nome Calling, which Nome is another city in Alaska. We have an outbreak of diphtheria. Ooh, diphtheria is a very deadly disease. It's still around today, really not found in the United States because it's passed with dirty water. And here, luckily, in places like the United States and other countries too, um, that have clean water systems, it's pretty much been wiped out and we do have medicines that can prevent it too and keep it away. We have no serum. We urgently need help. Known calling, known calling. Serum is another word for, for um, medicine. On January 20th, 1925, this telegram went out over the Alaskan wires. Diphtheria, deadly disease, had struck Nome, Alaska. Children were dying. The people of Nome desperately needed a life-saving serum, life-saving shot of medicine, to protect them from diphtheria. The medicine was in Anchorage, Alaska, but how could it be carried from Anchorage to Nome more than a thousand miles away. There was no train, plane, boat, or truck that was able to make the journey. In the winter, only a sled dog path called the Iditarod Trail linked Anchorage into Nome. Dog sleds took almost a month to deliver mail using this trail. Could dog sleds follow the, the Iditarod mail trail to deliver the life-saving medicine? Yes. 
But do you think that it would be very smart to do it in a month? That would take a long time, wouldn't it? A relay of dog teams was quickly organized. Expert mushers, the men who drive dog sleds, they're called mushers, and their strong dogs pitted their lives against the blinding snow and dangerous trail. Would these courageous sled dogs and the mushers arrive in time to save the people of Nome? The serum from Anchorage arrived by train to Nanana. The first musher, Wild Bill Shannon, dashed off with his team from Nanana on January 27th, 1925. So yeah, this is a true story. So here goes Wild Bill. That was his nickname, maybe because, well, why do you think he was his nickname? Make an inference and draw a conclusion. If he's a musher and lives in Alaska, chances are he probably had a lot of courage, didn't he? And maybe people thought that he was kind of wild and crazy for, for the things that he did. Shannon carried 20 pounds of precious serum lashed onto his, onto his sled. The thermometer read 40 degrees below zero. The temperature dropped to minus 50 degrees as Shannon and his determined dogs raced toward Tolovana, the end of the relay run. They traveled 52 miles in the frigid cold and blasting snow. The race for life, a 647 mile race against time, then began. The second leg of the relay, relay began when Edgar Cullen's team ran the serum to Dan Green at Manly Hot Springs. The relay continued day and night. Different mushers continued to carry the life-saving medicine toward no. So they're working in stages. So they have figured out in all these different, I guess maybe they have posts along this dog trail, the mail trail. So I guess maybe they have like little post offices. So a team would come, the team that would come and deliver the mail is in charge of delivering the serum to the next place. So they already probably knew the route to follow and what to do, but this was just different because they're trying to get medicine as quickly as they can. They traveled blind through the swirling snow caused white, that caused whiteouts. Musher's hands froze in the icy temperatures. The valuable serum froze in, in its warm coverings. Would it still be good against the diphtheria? Despite the blasting wind and brutal cold, the mushers kept going. Two dogs froze to death. The musher hitched himself into the lead dog position to pull his team to the relay point. So two of this guy's dogs died because it was so cold and, and in a blizzard. So he pulled the medicine. Ooh, we can make lots of inferences and draw a conclusion about that guy too. It's amazing what people can do when they are determined to help others. We could probably make some connections to what's going on in our world right now. Humans are amazing when we put something in our minds to do it. Famous musher Leonhard Seppala and his lead dog, Togo, joined the relay. On January 31st, this brave team safely crossed the Norton Sound in a storm. Three hours later, gale force winds broke up the Norton Sound ice. Seppala and Togo's team had to barely avoided disaster. So um, I know I've not seen it, but if you own Disney Plus, there is a new story that or a movie that was just released on Disney Plus when it came out back in January, I believe. And it's about Togo. It's the nonfiction text about Togo. So if you're interested in this, maybe go on Disney Plus if you have it and watch the Togo movie, which is based on this event. The howling wind and blinding snow continued. Seppala passed the serum then to Charlie Olson and Olson then to Gunnar Kaysen. Kaysen chose Balto as his lead dog. Balto was an intelligent black Siberian husky. Huskies have thick fur and powerful compact bodies designed for running fast. Their keen sense of smell up to 1,000 times a human's allows them to follow snow and ice covered trails. Balto's big chest helped him be an extremely strong dog. A serious storm raged. The dogs yelped, yipped, and jumped. They were eager to run. Mush! Kaysen commanded on February 1st, 1925. So it was January 27th. So 27, 28, 29, 30, 31. So this is like day six now. They've been going for less than a week. 
The team had 34 miles to go before they got to the next relay station and dog sled team. Determined, the dog Balto plunged headlong into the dark, raging storm. So Togo was a leg in this race. He say he did he and his team did amazing things too. So now Balto has taken over. He led his 10 dog teammates. The dogs raced with their ears pinned back. The curved, flexible wood sled glided over the rough trail. Snow drifts blocked the trail. Balto tried to blast through. Some dogs panicked as they sunk up to their bellies and necks in the snow. Balto led the team around the snow drifts and found his way back to the trail. No one waited as time ticked by. Balto continued to guide the sled to the Tomcock River. Suddenly he stopped. Mush, Kaysen demanded. Balto refused to move. Mush, Kaysen repeated. Balto continued to disobey his master. Kaysen walked to the head of the sled. Balto was standing in shallow water. The ice had cracked. Balto had saved the team and its valuable cargo from falling into the Arctic River water. So Balto refused. He said, no, this is dangerous. We can't go on. Had he continued, the team may have died. And then the medicine is completely lost. We have a different ending to this story. Balto faced the danger of frozen feet. Kaysen dried his paws with powdery snow before the team pushed on. Ready to race again, Kaysen looked down into the sled. The serum was gone. In the dark and with his eyes stinging with arrows of ice, Kaysen dug barehanded in the snow searching for the medicine. At last, he found the precious serum. Can you imagine? <gasps> you think, oh my goodness, we have been trying to move this serum this medicine that is gonna save people and children's lives, and now it's gone. So he's digging in the snow, in a blizzard, in blinding snow, in negative like 40 to 50 degree temperatures. Oh my gosh, what a hero. After midnight, Balto guided the sled to point safety, the last relay station with the new musher and dogs ready to go. That's what they thought. Kaysen was looking forward to resting, getting warm, and reading, feeding his dogs. But the station was dark. The weather was too bad. The musher had gone to bed and was not ready to sled the medicine to Nome. So he was like, eh, it's a blizzard. I don't trust it. I, I think we need to wait until the next day. Valuable time would be lost to wake up the musher and harness his team of dogs. So Kaysen decided Balto and his team were strong enough to run the remaining 21 miles to Nome. Point Safety to Nome was the last leg of the journey from Nanana. On February 2nd, 1925, at 5.30 in the morning, Balto safely guided Kaysen and his dog team into Nome. Exhausted and nearly frozen, they delivered the life-saving medicine. The dog sled teams of Alaska made the journey of 674 miles in just five and a half days. Because they said the mail route, it took about a month, so they took their time. This was done in five and a half days, a new world record. News of the courageous and dangerous race for life made headlines all across the United States. Balto was famous. A Hollywood movie producer brought Case and Balto and the rest of the sled dogs to Los Angeles, California. The famous sled dog team toured the United States. The same year, 1925, a statue of Balto was placed in Central Park in New York City. It's still there to celebrate the historic race of life to Nome, Alaska. Balto lived the rest of his life at the Brookside Zoo in Cleveland, Ohio. So people could then go and, and he was taken care of at the zoo and people could go and um, meet him by um, looking at him at the zoo there. He died on March 14th, 1933. He was 14 years old. So that's about an average lifespan for a dog his size. The it Iditarod, the world famous dog sled race from Anchorage to Nome, takes place now every March. The challenging dog sled race celebrates the pioneer spirit of brave sled dogs like Balto. Balto remains a symbol of courage, intelligence, and sacrifice. So here is a cartoon picture of the statue in Central Park in New York City, reminding everyone, it's a good reminder for us today, in 2020 that 95 years ago some people were determined to save others in a major health crisis 
Now, maybe it wasn't a worldwide crisis like this one is, but I challenge you to look for the people that are helping today. People like Balto, even, you know, animals that were helping, but look at the doctors and the nurses and other people working at the hospitals right now. People working in the, in the radio and TV business even that are continuing to bring us the news. All of those people are helpers. So now we're ready to race. But notice I keep my text right here. If I need it, I'm going to use it. Don't put it away. It's what good readers do. Seriously. Okay. So now, there we go. Here's my question. Why do you feel, or what, I'm sorry, huh, I got to read myself. What do you feel was Balto's best quality and why? So there's nothing in this that says, OPS, Balto could be described as this, 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 this. We have to make inferences. We have to make an inference and draw a conclusion based on what he is. Now, at the end, it says, Balto remains a symbol of courage, intelligence, and sacrifice. To sacrifice means to give up something. He was tired. He was hungry. He didn't want to keep going. But it was almost like Balto knew that what they were doing was too important. Maybe he didn't understand what he was moving and he and his team were moving, but he knew there was a reason that they were out in that weather and that his musher was telling him, you've got to keep going. So he, he probably realized there was something very important. So I personally, what do you feel was Balto's best quality? Let me see this again. Yeah, that was not bad. Ah, that one's a bit better though. So I'm gonna draw my line up here. There is my question so that I can go back and look at it if I need to. But I'm going to make a decision. I could, you know, if I was with cla uh, my class right now, I would say, okay, well, let's brainstorm and come up with some ideas on what Balto was. We know that he was smart. We know that he was hardworking. We know that he had courage. We know that... He, you know, some people might say, well, he, he didn't give up. Okay. I would say that his best quality was, I'm thinking about whenever he stopped in the water and whenever he kept going. So he was probably determined. He was determined. And that can cover many different things to have what's called determination. It means you don't give up. You know you have a goal and you're not going to stop until you need it. So we're going to explain the different ways that he was determined in this. What now they do every year in March, an, an honorary I did a rod. Um, several teams race it. See who finishes first. So remember how I said we can restate an answer in really the first sentence. So what do you feel is Balto's best quality and why? I feel Balto's best quality was he was determined. Done, but I'm not done. I'm done with the first easy part. Read between the lines, figured out what his best quality was. So now this is how I teach this. Um, I say you can cite evidence and explain at the same time, but in order to cite evidence, you need to come up with some phrases to prove that you just didn't make this up. Because somebody is going to say, well, how do you know? Where did you get this? So phrases such as, the text says, 
the author says, um, the text states, etc. Etc. means ongoing, ongoing. So anything that kind of falls into that category is going to prove that you got this from the book. You got this from the text that you were using. And then I'm going to explain by putting down some facts, okay? Why was he determined? Well, the text says Balto um, refused to go on when the ice had cracked because his sled would be in danger. So there is, let me tilt this a little bit. There is one thing that explains why he's determined. He was determined. He, he, he said, no, you've got to listen to me. You've got to understand that I'm making this choice right now to save your life. So it took a while for his musher to realize, or at least a minute or so to realize why Balto stopped. But he was determined. He said, I'm not going to give in because you're going to die if I do. And I'm going to die. And I don't want either one of us to die and the rest of these dogs either. Okay, so then um, what else was he determined? Well, he kept going and leading the team when he was tired, hungry, freezing, right? I always say a good race too. I should have told this at you, to you at the beginning. Try to write at least five sentences. Could you do a race in even two to three sentences? Yeah, but I say at least five sentences is going to give you at least a couple sentences of citing to explain why you feel the way you do. Um, so now we can say, and I've already said the text says, I could say the author told us, a little different way of, of citing that evidence, but I know that it's there. The author told us Balto led the team an additional, that, ooh, that's a big word that means um, added more, an additional 21 miles, comma, even though he was tired, hungry, comma, and very cold. Okay, so I have one sentence. Restate and answer. Two, three. I'm going to come up with one more, okay? So I know that what happened at the end to show he was determined. They got the medicine for the illness there. At least we can assume probably at least 12 or hours or more before it would have gotten there. Who knows? So we can say Balto was, and this would be kind of where an opinion comes in. Balto was, um, strong and his team got the medicine to know. Okay. So that kind of says, yeah, you threw in the opinion he was strong. But then, okay, we explained he was tired, hungry, very cold. They got the medicine to know. So now I'm going to show you, kind of tilt my head in a little bit so you can see me. Um, 
I'm going to show you how to end this. An easy way to end a race question is to restate the main idea. So when in doubt, you can come back up here. This shows why Balto's best quality was he was determined. Maybe you have an argument for a different quality and you could have written a whole other race based on maybe you said it was just, he was smart and you explained why he was smart. Whatever it may be, you can go back and restate the main idea. This is why I feel Balto's best quality was da da. You can also end it. I always I, I challenge my boys and girls to end it in a couple different ways too. One way is to give a good solid opinion. And a good solid opinion, boys and girls, is not something that says, I like Balto. Well, good for you. You've told me nothing. <laughs> I like Balto too. But why do you like Balto? Give me another reason that you like him. Or you can maybe make a connection to this, a text-to-text -text connection or a text-to-self connection to Balto. You do something like that. If you make an outside connection to this or you give a strong, valid opinion on the text that you've just read, I always tell my boys and girls, you're going to melt whoever's reading its face off because they're going to be so impressed. They're going to be like, oh my gosh, I cannot even handle this. It's just going to melt away. So try to melt my face off here. I'm going to attempt to melt your face off. Okay. So I'm going to say Balto was strong. This team got the medicine to Nome. Um, I feel clue for stating an opinion. I feel this is something that's not in the text. This is going to show that I understand what it is that I've read. I feel Balto was a hero during, uh, oh my gosh, I am, I'm about to melt my own face off here, during a crisis. And boys and girls, you may have heard that word recently. We, with COVID-19, are currently in a crisis situation. But I just told you, look for good qualities in people. Look for people that are helping others. Look for ways how you can help others in this crisis situation. What can you learn from Balto today? I would say never give up too could be something. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen. I hope that you have learned something amazing today. I hope that you continue to reading. I, <laughs> that didn't make any sense. I hope you continue reading. I hope you continue writing in your reading. And my challenge to you, I would love to see you do a race based on um, Balto, come up with another quality that you feel could describe him as a best quality and why. That's my challenge for you. Five sentences at least. Um, I will see you tomorrow and you're doing an amazing job. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep reading, keep learning. And until then, two little poodles. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.